God. Um, so good evening, everyone. Nos Waitha. I haven't sworn, have I? Um, I'm delighted to be here in Cardiff. Clearly, you won't be quite so delighted with my Welsh, so I apologise for that. Um, for the last decade, I have been bidding for or staging the London 2012 Olympic Games and more recently helping to host the Glasgow Commonwealth Games and then last week, the Invictus Games in London. These events and the 30 years, yes, 30 years on the global communication scene has taught me an awful lot of things about winning hearts and minds. And London 2012 really encapsulates them and brings them all together. And I want to talk to you a bit about that today. When people ask me what and why were the games so successful, I, I normally try and ask them who they are first because people have very, very specific ideas about, uh, about why. But I do tend to think about it very carefully. Um, was it the athletes? Undoubtedly, they just performed amazingly. Was it the team that we had in place organising it? Absolutely. Was it the attention to detail and planning? Yes, it was. Was it the volunteers, the way the British public got behind it, the city of London itself, all of the host nations and the way they got behind it? Yes, 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 it was all of those things that came together in an amazing way. But for me, it started with a really strong purpose. It started with a vision uh, that was clear. It was consistently reiterated, and it was reiterated a lot. Um, and it connected with people, but more importantly, it connected with their lives. And I think, for me, it was that that helped create the strong and enduring partnerships that really made the games the success that they were. In hindsight, um, the creation of our vision, you know, which was to use the power of the games to inspire lasting change, was actually the easy bit. Didn't feel like it at the time, but it was. Much harder was actually transitioning it from the bid to the games and creating the engagement that we promised it would do. And uh, it was that that really made it the game changer that it became. It required us to build a network of strong partnerships with a huge number of stakeholders, all of which tested our joint buy-in to the vision and our unified understanding of what that vision meant and what the journey was over seven years. So we had, you know, really it's about a 10-year journey. We had about two and a half years to bid for it. And the promises we made during that bid were critical to deliver over the next seven years. And we were unusual for an organizing committee. Most games in the past have had a bid team who bid, then they go, see you later. Uh, and then the organising team gets put in place and they go, really? Who on earth thought this was a good idea? Um, and then they change it. So what we had was the same team primarily, half of the organising board were the same all the way through the bid and um, the games themselves. So we actually had no excuse but to deliver on the promises that we made. And I think that was really, really important. I think it's a template that the International Olympic Committee wants to try and see going forward. Um, but we knew the Games couldn't just be about London. Uh, it had to engage the whole country. So we established the Nations and Regions Group. Uh, from the outset, Wales was a really proactive member of the group. They consulted widely across Wales about what they wanted to get from the Games. They had a clear vision. Um, they aligned that vision to the one we had, which was helpful. Um, and their vision was to ensure that Wales benefited from the Games before, during, and really importantly, after the event had taken place through maximising the sporting, economic and cultural impact on the Welsh nation, boosting tourism and enhancing Wales's global reputation. And they set really clear goals at the very beginning. They were part of our Nations and Regions team in the bid and they stayed as part of the team going all the way through to the end of the Games. And it resulted in some clear wins for Wales. Um, 24 separate nations set up training camps here in Wales. That was 800 athletes, coaches and supporters were based here in this nation. 68 Welsh athletes were selected for Team GB. Seven Olympic golds and 15 Paralympic medals were won. There were 103 community and national projects that were awarded the Inspire Mark. They engaged 100,000 people across Wales. One in four people in Wales saw the Olympic flame 
when it was, came on its journey across uh, and through Wales. And I've been told by the coordinator of the Nations and Regions Group in Wales to say, we had the best weather we have ever had <laughs> during that torch relay, and it was better than any other nation. So I feel like I've now done, <laughs> I've now done that bit. Um, there were 350,000 spectators um, at the uh, Olympic football, many of them from outside of Wales, and many of them who had never been to a big football match and a sporting event um, in this country or in this nation. And we had 1,255 Welsh schools registered with the London 2012 Education Programme. And that, what that meant was that the Welsh school children were able to be torchbearers. They were appointed as young ambassadors. They participated in the host nation campaign. They received mascot visits. Um, some may not think that was a great thing, but the kids loved it. Um, and also, they secured um, the really valuable games tickets at no cost to them. So that was an extraordinary um, uh, way of participating. But also, that it was really important in sport. If you look at what you have coming down the track over the next few years, it's really important. Tomorrow, the host city announcement is made for Euro 2020, and Cardiff is one of 19 cities that put their name forward for that. Next year, Cardiff has eight matches in the Rugby World Cup. In 2015 also, the UCI Velathon, I mean, that's a word I've never even heard of, but apparently it's something to do with cycling and distance. Uh, but Velathon Wales is coming here, which will be big. In 2016, um, the World Half Marathon is here. In 2017-18, the Volvo Ocean Race. Uh, so there's a huge sporting legacy as well that uh, Cardiff and Wales will have on the back of it. Um, but it was never just about the year 2012. It always was about the 10 years after the Games and how people could really benefit and take, uh, and, and take heart from the, uh, from the legacy. There is a great report, if anyone wants to uh, go forward and read it. The Welsh um, Government Director of Tourism and Marketing, Jonathan Jones, at the time headed up the, the um, Welsh part of Nations and Regions Group. And Arthur Amir, who was head of major events unit at the time, also was the coordinator. And they did a fantastic end of games wrap up report that went through all of the benefits, set out what the objectives and the goals were at the beginning, and also what was achieved by the end. And it's still being achieved, I hope, as we go forward. For all of us, it was about establishing early why we were doing it and hosting it, and how we were going to do it, and how it was going to benefit. People understood why we wanted to stage the games. Still, we had to spend seven years reiterating it and also communicating how we were going to do it and how they were going to benefit from it. Having a clear vision and simple promises that were delivered on was really at the centre of the game's success, but it doesn't stop you constantly having to tell the story. And that's sort of part of your responsibility for staging a major, a major event. Um, it does seem odd to think that London 2012 Games potentially was the last time we'll all work together as um, a United Kingdom, but uh, we'll wait and see tomorrow morning what's happened in Scotland. The authenticity, for me it's about vision, and I mentioned this earlier, a clear sense of purpose. The authenticity of a vision, whether you're a major sporting event or a business, is really about your ability to make good on the promises you make. These aren't promises other people make for you, these are promises you make to other people. And also being accountable for the ambition that you set. It's so much harder doing it really than saying it, but it's absolutely critical to getting people to stay with you on the journey. Our ability to stand by our ambition, 10 years out, remember, 10 years out, and inspire others to join the journey was directly linked to their belief in our vision and the way it was relevant to their lives and the evidence of our actions. Simply put, if those experiences and action lack authenticity, you lose the public. It was all about quality of the relationships we developed across and along that journey. So what does that mean to businesses today? It means understanding a wide range of different groups, not just your core customers, but pretty much anybody who can influence them at any stage. It means spending time working out what great really does look like, communicating it, and making sure everybody understands what you stand for and what you're trying to achieve. Importantly, it means listening, and I mean really listening, and finding solutions that work for people, other people, not just you. Priorities need to be made, decisions taken, but they must be done with knowledge, integrity, and a deep understanding of what you want to deliver. 
When you have a large group of partners, stakeholders, other relationships, this is critical. With us, it started with a clear vision that everyone bought into. It was the one thing that we all agreed on. Public, stakeholders, partners, there were many things we didn't agree on as we went on our journey, but we were always able to take those disagreements back to the one thing that we all bought into. Um, for us, it was about, it's, it's a vision can unite. You know, it creates an understanding with groups, employees, customers, stakeholders, politicians. Um, it helps you to navigate your organization. And not just in times that are going well, but it really helps you make decisions when times are tough. You know, what is it we really stand for? And we made lots of decisions. There's never, ever enough money in staging a major event. You always have to compromise. It's like running a business. There's never enough money to do everything you want to do. But being clear about your purpose, where you're going, and what you stand for helps you and other people in the organization make the right decisions when the time comes. A good vision inspires people. People get up in the morning, and I really believe this. They get up in the morning to do something good. They don't get up in the morning to do something bad. They get up, they want to be inspired. And a recent YouGov poll, I think it was last year, showed that only 25% of our employees think our bosses are inspiring. That is depressing. That is really depressing. These are people who want to be inspired, and we have the ability to do that. A good vision also creates and builds trust. People know what it means. They also know what to expect when they interact with you and they have any type of uh, relationship with you. And also, it involves everyone. It is not tailored to one group. I'm from communications. Phones ring all the time. Go for it. It's fine. It's fine. Um, it involves everyone. It's not tailored to one single group. Um, and a vision ultimately is sustainable. <laughs> That's um, it, it is sustainable, and I don't mean that just in a tree-hugging way, tree-hugging, good, I'm not saying that, but it's here for the long term, it's not changeable, it's not one of your strategic goals, the vision needs to be there, it needs to be a good platform for people to really understand who you are and what to expect. I'm sure lots of you in this room know this story, but I never tire from telling it, and it's not an Olympic story, sorry, but I'm going to, and I really hope you don't tire from hearing it, but in May 1961, President John F. Kennedy set the American nation and NASA a seemingly impossible challenge. His words, but without the American accent, I believe this nation, I sort of do you think I'm shouting now, I think I'm, I'm trying to be a president. I believe this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important, for the long-range exploration of space. And none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. Very clear ambition, very, very ambitious, but also very honest about what it might take. In doing this, President Kennedy had set NASA a long-term goal. One, they willingly accept accepted. Why? Because actually it was what they were set up to do. It was their purpose. It's the reason they existed. And actually, it's still the reason they exist today. A year later, in 1962, President Kennedy visited NASA, toured the Space Center, and he met with the janitor and asked him what he did. The janitor told him he was helping to land a man on the moon. President Kennedy, clearly impressed, asked the janitor, how is he doing that? And the janitor told him that by keeping the restrooms clean, he was showing the astronauts that they were cared for. And by doing this, keeping their, their morale high so they could do their job. And that was how he was helping to land one of them on the moon. In much the same way as our 2012 games makers helped us to inspire a generation by helping every visitor to the games make them feel, uh, and made them feel like they were the heroes um, of the people they had come to see. I wonder if the same can be said about many organizations here today. And I don't mean just here in this room, I mean that exist today. On our journey, we had three prime ministers and two elections, three mayors, sorry, two mayors and three elections, four secretaries of state and three sports ministers. That's before you even start to count the critical delivery partners like the Metropolitan Police, Transport for London, the London Boroughs, the Royal Parks, the 40-odd sponsors, 
they weren't odd, just I can't remember whether it's 42 or 47, uh, 19 government departments. Each and every one of these partners needed to be engaged and on the journey with us. First, they had to understand what we were trying to achieve, and they had to understand the journey that they were taking with us. But our most important partner in delivering the Games, our number one stakeholder, were the people across the country. And make no mistake about it, if we did not get that right, they would be bickering from the sidelines, which, believe it or not, was the best outcome, um, or they would completely disengage with us, which would have been the worst. They were demanding, but for us, the more demanding they were, the better. It meant they cared. It meant they owned it. It meant they were, we were relevant to their lives and what they were doing. And it meant that they would join us in delivering what ended up being the greatest games ever. But it wasn't up to them to engage with us. And this is a really important point. It was up to us to engage them. And modern communication, and the landscape we have, means there are no shortage of channels or platforms but you need to use them all. Don't be afraid of them. Embrace them. Use them well. Will they all work? No, they won't. But most of them will. The public needs to be inspired and motivated at a local level, just like you do. So it's important to create ways for people to engage with your organisation in ways that appeal to them. Not always the same as what may appeal to each of you. But in true partnership, we need to find ways for people to join in. There has never been a better time to create strong and enduring relationships with customers, but you have to understand them first. I have been fortunate to work in an industry that's seen massive change. Communications today has changed the way we do business. It's changed the way most of us lead our lives. Uh, it's not just about technological advancement, though. It's also about how well you use the technology to embrace the platforms that seem to spring from nowhere. The advent of social media is a phenomenon, and it has been a real game changer for business authenticity and partnerships. From a games perspective, let me share the advent of social media. I worked on the Sydney 2000 games in Australia. Obviously, that's 2000. Hardly any fast internet connections. We sold tickets by putting a magazine inside a newspaper with a hard copy application form. People had to complete it. They then had to send it back with a check. Do you remember checks? Um, and it all arrived at the organizing committee, who then had to manually go through every check and every form. Trust me, not, people aren't good at filling in forms, <laughs> really not good. Um, then they had to go back. They then allocated the tickets in the same way here that we did over here through a ballot. Um, and when they didn't get their tickets, they held on to the money to offer them more tickets. Um, and uh, then eventually, Lots of people came to Sydney to say, we want our money back, um, at which point they then had to write checks back to everybody for the tickets that they didn't get. Huge process, but no fast um, internet connections. In Athens in 2004, there were hardly any smartphones, no Facebook. It was launched in February 2004, but it really didn't get fully operating until September 2006. We won the bid in 2005. In Beijing in 2008, not many people had social networking accounts, certainly not in China, um, and not many were aware of Twitter. There were 300,000 tweets a day. Vancouver, 2010, the Winter Olympics and Paralympics, that was two years before our games. No Instagram, no Tumblr, no Google+, and there probably were around 35 million tweets a day. Two years later, there were 350 million tweets a day during our games, 5 billion mobile phones, 7 billion texts sent daily, 300 million photos downloaded every day, and 900 million monthly active users on Facebook. And that is just through the prism of the games. So we were digital by default, not really by design. Whoever hosted the games in 2012 would have had to face that. But we had to create 77 new products, sites, or services in six years. And we managed to do it without spending a single penny more than we had budgeted for in 2005. And we did it purely by changing the way and the platforms we used, not by adding more and more things. We took a lot of stuff away from traditional media, or we actually utilized a lot of content across social media that we use for um, traditional media. And we spent a huge amount of time working on things that would cross language barriers, huge amount of time on video, photos, things that really would tell a story that wasn't just words. We had five million social media followers from 201 countries and territories. 
who can guess? None of my team. Which moment was the most tweeted moment of the games? Who wants to take a guess? I can't see you, so you have to chat. Yes. Queen. Nope. Next. You saying balls? Nope. No. I'm going to... T sorry? No, but I'm going to tell you. So, peaking at eight, 80,000 tweets per minute was Usain Bolt's 200 metres, because it's twice as long as the 100 metres. Um, but the number one tweeted moment of the Games that rose to 116,000 tweets per minute was for the Spice Girls in the closing ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Who would have thought? <laughs> So the interesting thing with that is that it doesn't matter what technology you have, it doesn't matter how you, or processes and systems you have in place, actually you can never forget that behind the technology are real people who need to understand your values and your motivations. It's no longer about us, it's all about them. Um, they hold all the power. We need to listen, properly listen, and properly understand what they're saying. To reach them, we also have to understand what life is like for them and for young people. And it's very different to the world that we grew up in. Uh, their world is more complex, it's more cluttered, and it's a lot more conflicted. We had to create messages that broke through to our audiences and connected with them, built real partnerships with them. And they won't always be our values. And who can blame them when they're faced with some of the things they are today? Trust is bust. Businesses of the future must fill the growing gap in trust that young people have in adult society, brought about by a series of institutional, religious, governmental scandals and failures exacerbated by the financial crisis that are challenging their beliefs in our own institutions and in our values. And they are creating their own value ecosystem. Sport, even with the occasional mutations, can do this. But, comp but a compelling vision, a clear purpose, authentic engagement underpins it. Once you have these in place, then your advocates become your fans. In my experience, there are three main challenges facing today's CEOs, over and above good financial performance, clearly still critical. Whether it's a startup or an established business, whether it's a large business or a small one, whether it's local, national or global, the three are they need to protect and enhance the reputation of their organization. They need to drive authenticity right through their brand and their organization. And they need to unlock the power of good in their organization, their employees, their customers, or the communities in which they operate. It doesn't matter whether you're selling a global sports event or selling shampoo. The Good Relations Group, of which I am very proudly the CEO, is built on a core guiding principle that these in these radically transparent times, what is good for business and shareholders must also be good for customers, society, and the planet. If you are not true to your vision, your purpose, you will be found out. And our new piece of research, which we launched this morning in London, backs this up. It's called Triple G, and this research measures and rates brands against three factors required to earn the love and loyalty of customers. Why do we do it? Because A, it doesn't exist, and B, because we believe the hearts and minds are one across three dimensions of good. So with, today, with today's and tomorrow's customers, imagine this for just one moment. Worldwide corporate assets are estimated by Accenture at $60 trillion. I don't even know what that figure looks like, but it, I think it has roughly around 13 zeros in it. Of that $60 trillion, over half, $35 trillion are assets that are intangible assets, such as skills, culture, leadership, relationships, and reputation. The sources, these are sources of advantage that cannot be created quickly, but more importantly, they can't be copied by your competitors. Triple G measures the following three elements. They measure what you do, i.e. your actions, even when no one's looking, um, what you say, how you engage, with people, do you understand me? And, what, and also, what others say about you. Do they recommend you to friends and family? It isn't only a measure of performance, giving brands an early indication of success or issues. It stimulates a completely different conversation within organizations. Conversations about purpose, 
authenticity, alignment of marketing programs with long-term business strategy, not short-term business goals. And where in an organization, the vision of a leader or a leadership group breaks down and why that happens. Triple G is based on research amongst 12,000 consumers that we did earlier this year, 120 brands, and we have 50,000 individual verbatims. What it showed was that 16 companies out of 120 do well across those three dimensions of good. Good actions, good engagement, and good recommendations. And they're companies like, unsurprisingly some of them, John Lewis, Weetabix, Waitrose, PayPal, Amazon, Cadbury, Panasonic, Samsung. There's clearly room for improvement, but the three traits the Triple G companies and brands had in common were quality of the service or product they delivered, respect, they absolutely respected their customer, they didn't treat them like they were irrelevant to them. And also they were relevant to their lives. These are people who you know, felt that these, all of these brands had a place in their lives and they were relevant to them and their families. Intangible assets like your reputation and your relationships are your most valuable, but also your most vulnerable assets in this high speed, high scrutiny, highly cynical and also highly transparent world we live in. Big sporting events with their long lead times, their clarity of purpose, and their necessary partnerships are also good organizations to learn from. In summary, I've been in the business 25 years and probably a bit more, um, but I'm still learning. And it's a great time to be in any type of business if you embrace the change and understand the power of your intangible assets. So what have I learned from the worldwide multi-sport events that can translate across to business today? One, relationships. Partnerships are not just important, they're critical. Nobody and no company today can operate on their own. It's always about people. Doesn't matter how many processes, doesn't matter how great technology is. At the end of pretty much every transaction that you do, there is a human being. And third, and I would say this, but I really mean it, good communication follows good policy. I have long, long, I hope, other days where people would just chuck a decision down to their PR department and say, go on, love, make it fly. I say I hope because it actually happened not long ago. But it shouldn't happen. Good communications follows good policy. Involve your communications people early. But I think there are seven important things businesses can learn and from, about winning hearts and minds that we use during the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games. Firstly, it's vision. It's your organization's DNA. It's a compass. It's who you are. It tells people what to expect. And if things go wrong, it helps not just you as a leader, but also everybody in your organization make the right decision and do the right thing. If your vision is not clear, then you cannot expect or when people that are three, four, five, 20 layers down from a senior leadership team to be able to make the right decision or the same decision you would make. The second is integrate your communications. Convergence of social media means this is critical. Speed and transparency means that authenticity is absolutely critical. Um, and if you are authentic and people see that, actually love and loyalty will follow it. Relationships, partnerships, you can't do it alone, but make sure they share your vision and your purpose because as much as they can enhance your reputation, the wrong relationships and the wrong partnerships can actually damage you quite badly. Advocates, take your customers, turn them into fans, and then turn them into advocates. And you can do that by genuinely understanding who they are. Content, create it once. Use it a multiple, multiple, multiple times. Platforms and audiences converge. There is so much content out there. Most of it is rubbish. I've been told I can't swear, so I'm going to say rubbish. I really mean something much, much stronger than that. Um, but it is so much is rubbish. But when you create content, be relevant. If you don't find it interesting, trust me, no one else is going to because you actually have a vested interest in finding it interesting. So find, look, at, look at the content that is sent out into the ether and go, is this really interesting or relevant or am I just adding to the rubbish that's out there? Um, and the creativity is the sixth one. Stand out, be different, and be brave. People want to share great ideas, great thoughts. They want to be inspired. And you know what? Nothing will last forever. Sometimes things will work, sometimes things won't. But be brave. People want to share and talk to each other around brave and great stories. Um, and also your team. There's only one team. I mean, I 
phrase the sort of, or quote the musketeer is all for one and one for all your employees your stakeholders your customers do you know what they all are the, they've all converged no longer can you say something to a politician and something else to your employee actually they all follow each other they all talk to each other they're all potentially friends in some social media chaos out there um, so being really really clear that your team is one um, lots of companies for very good reasons financial for one uh, will make statements and announcements that go to the public first and then days later to their employees. I mean, there are obviously financial restrictions on um, financial performances and who and how you can say things. But saying things to politicians and not to your employees, saying things to the media and not to your employees, saying things to your analysts and not to your employees, bad. And you will again be found out because ultimately lots of these people will follow your employees, whether they are on Twitter or Facebook or wherever they might be. And uh, if you're not telling the same story uh, and you're not being authentic, you will, as I said, you will be found out. As I end, and I really don't want to end being miserable, but I think I might be, sorry. What I really wonder is if there is a shortage of skills in the corporate world when it comes to truly understanding how to engage consumers and other stakeholders in this current transparent world. I don't know whether it's fear um, or apprehension of the new challenges or the new channels and platforms that are out there. Maybe a fickleness of consumers, but hey, get used to it. That's, what's, that's the future. Um, or is it lack of listening on behalf of the corporate world? Or perhaps organisations are just not clear about or clear enough about their purpose and their vision, their reason to exist. They're not articulating it well enough to engage partners or their stakeholders to understand it. Or worse, actually it's not believable. Whatever the reason, we need to address this engagement deficit quickly. Strong, enduring, relevant partnerships will be critical to business success in the future, but stand for nothing if there is not a common purpose or the skills required to properly, authentically and effectively engage customers. It is the ultimate partnership. I do want to say that I have a great group of people and a great team of people I work with who really do understand this. And our purpose is to help companies build authentic brands and thrive in a world where good business genuinely matters. On the table in front of me, <laughs> I have Andy and Beth, um, who are from our Cardiff office, and Zoe, who leads our regional business based in Manchester, is also here. Um, they'd be happy to help any of you. They'd also be very happy to share with you any of the Triple G research that we have done today and we've released today. Um, so do go and talk to them. And that ends my talk.